Hello and welcome to the latest Professional Pensions webinar looking at retiring in turbulent times and how to support members to make the right retirement decisions, a discussion we are holding in association with Wealth at Work. My name is Jonathan Stapleton. I'm the editor of Professional Pensions and I'll be your chair for this session. Inflation in the UK it has now hit double digit levels and is expected to remain high for some time. Uh, intensifying the current cost of living crisis. While it's clearly a difficult time for many, it is particularly challenging for those planning to retire, especially when faced with a fall in the value of their pension due to market volatility. This webinar will look at the key considerations for members as they approach retirement and assess how schemes and employers can help them decide on the right course of action. In addition, it will discuss the extent to which schemes and employers could use financial education, guidance and advice to help make uh, members make the best choices and how that could be most effectively provided. To discuss these issues, I'm delighted to welcome Jonathan Watsley, Director of Wealth at Work, Stuart Walters, Trustee Director 2020 Trustees, and Ian Baines, a senior pension professional recently retired from his role as Head of Pensions at Nationwide Building Society. Just to remind you all, this is an interactive session. If you have a question to put to our panel, please type it into the Ask Question box on your screen. I'll ask as many of these as possible during the discussion. Well, gentlemen, good morning and welcome. Um, first of all, I was hoping for each of you to tell us a little bit about who you are and what it is you do. Jonathan, can I come to you first, please? Yeah, sure. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so Jonathan Watsley, Director at Wealth at Work. So Wealth at Work are the leading provider of financial education, guidance and advice in the workplace. Uh, a lot of that work is uh, in the retirement space, so particularly looking at people aged 50 and above and the decisions that they need to make. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Jonathan. Uh, Stuart. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you for inviting me along today and welcome everybody on the webinar. I'm a trustee director at 2020 Trustees. Uh, I've been a professional trustee now for a good 15 years, overseeing both defined benefit and defined contribution scheme types. What's helped me in my career, I've also worked in industry. I really, that really taught me how pensions fits into the, uh, into the corporate environment. One of my passions is helping people engage with their finances, and I'm hoping to share some of my experiences with you on this webinar. Thank you very much indeed. Last but not least, Ian. Thank you, Jonathan. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so as Jonathan said in the introduction, uh, I've recently uh, retired, left uh, my role at, at Nationwide Building Society. Uh, having said that, I've still got roles uh, in a part-time nature, Aviva, uh, on their Independence Governance Committee and in a NED-type role uh, in the plumbing pension industry scheme. Um, but like Stuart said, uh, I've spent most of my career in pensions and you know, at the heart of all of that is members uh, and, and looking after their interests. So I spent um, many, many roles uh, working with trustees and sponsors. And at the heart of that is employee engagement and, and helping people make the right decisions. So this is something I'm equally passionate about. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, J Jonathan, if I can come to you and, and ask you to set out a little bit of the background for our discussion today. What, in your view, are the key considerations for members at the current time? And how is the cost of living crisis impacting those, particularly in the run up to retirement? So I think that the since Freedom and Choice came in, uh, clearly, members have had uh, a lot more flexibility and a, and, a, and a lot more choice. And of course, many uh, people will have multiple pensions of multiple types as well. So that that creates more complexity. Uh, so the decisions that people need to make have become more complex. For people that understand that complexity and um, will get support in understanding that complexity, uh, clearly can make better decisions and better decisions for members basically means that they get more income in retirement than perhaps they, they otherwise would. For those that do not understand it, then ultimately they may get less income in retirement than they otherwise would. And we typically see that because of 
uh, uh, not really understanding what their, their options are. So often they will, for example, pay more tax than than than, than they would need to, or they. Uh, and one of the ways that often manifests itself is just in the way that they draw down assets. So you know the classic example is 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 uh, taking all your taking your money out of your pension and then having a, a big tax charge, and then you effectively you know perhaps you've been a basic rate taxpayer all your life, and all of a sudden you you become a higher rate taxpayer in 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 that given year. Um, and particularly when they have those, those other assets that may be either taxable assets or, or even things like ISAs, where they could actually draw those down um, and uh, actually start optimizing um, their position. So, so all of those things um, all, all go towards your actual retirement income. And at the end of the day, when we, when we peel away all the complexities of pensions of course all the member really cares about is how much income they are going to get in retirement that is that is really the sole sole purpose of why they've saved for 40 years so understanding uh uh their options and what they can achieve is really really important now uh certainly from the age of 50 and um, we could we could debate that age but but broadly speaking from the age of 50 often people have decisions to make so they need to have some idea of what their options are when they ultimately retire and therefore what their, their investment uh, pathway is going to look like. Um, and we've seen in, in recent times with some of the volatility, um, we've seen in, seen in bond prices where uh, there's actually been quite a lot of coverage of, of people saying, well, hold on a minute, my, I, I was moved into bonds because I understood they were safe and now, and now that the, the value of those have reduced dramatically. So clearly there's certain things that people do not understand and yet they're, they're, they're making those decisions. Now, as, as you get towards retirement, I think uh, I think the cost of living crisis is clearly uh, uh, raising issues about, well, what, what, what is the size of my pot? Can I actually afford to retire? Clearly there's a lot of market volatility. Um, uh, 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 there's a lot of the markets out there that are substantially down. I mean, you particularly look at the NASDAQ, for example. Uh, so people will need to make decisions about, well, can they still afford to retire or um, uh, do they need to carry on working? Uh, uh, do they just accept they're going to have less less income? Um, uh, but of course, with inflation riding high, as you suggest, Jonathan, we, we've already seen anecdotally evidence of people that, are, that have already actually retired but are now looking to return to the to the workforce because they realise that the income they have isn't actually going to give them that standard of living, uh, no matter how how modest that, that that standard of living may may be. So there's a lot of issues swirling around. I think um, uh, a lot of those clearly created by that volatility and cost of living crisis. Thank you, thank you very much indeed, Jonathan. Um, uh, Stuart, can I uh, come to you? Do, do you sort of uh, have have the same sort of agree with Jonathan? Do you sort of see the same issues for members at the current time? Yes, absolutely. I think it's just important to go back in time. Um, we're in the 10th anniversary of auto enrolment, which has been a huge success. You know, over 10 million uh, extra members uh, in participating in these various pension schemes. And back then, many employers replaced, amended their pension offering. Uh, but of course, the pension landscape is constantly evolving. Uh, as Jonathan alluded to, the pension freedoms in 2015 was a huge game changer. It brought so much more choice, but with choice comes uh, comes the uh, complexity. Um, and I think it's fair to say that many pension schemes now look a little outdated. Um, and if we take member communications, historically, Communications has often been driven by uh, disclosure regulations sent in the post, but we're in a very different place today. Communications, a lot of time and energy is spent around um, uh, coming up with a communication strategy, uh, the appointment of communication specialists, delivering a, a far richer information stream, both on quality and content. And in terms of the current issue, well, yes, I mean, in the stock, we've seen stock markets, bond markets uh, tumble over the uh, over the calendar year, and in, in a high inflation environment where inflation is running at let's say ten percent, if your uh, pension pot has not uh, grown at all, then it's uh, your, your purchasing power is is down by ten percent. Uh, it's not just about the today; it's how that uh, purchasing power will erode over over the uh, over the coming years. 
I think from a member's point of view, they want to know, uh, can I afford uh, having the lifestyle that I want in retirement? Um, and and an, another very valid question is, uh, am I going to outlive my uh, my pension pot? They're probably the two crunch questions uh, facing um, uh, near near retirees at the in the current climate. Thank you very much indeed. In can I come to you on that one? Do you you've seen similar issues? I, I have, and I, I, I would agree with many of the points both Joe Stewart and Jonathan have, have made. I guess I, I, there's two things I would particularly sort of call out. Uh, one uh, is um, you know. <laughs> For many people, it's not one pension pot, it's many, and they might be a mixture of DB, DC, hybrid, and pension freedoms have given people opportunities at earlier ages to do things with their pension. Uh, so, so not necessarily one pot, uh, one pension, so that'd be the first thing, and that creates complexity, clearly lots of choice with it, but complexity as well. But the other thing I would call out is that retirement and drawing your pension are two different things. And, and, and many people will look to do things with pension pots and carry on working uh, in different forms. And, and that sort of, you know, when Jonathan talked about the tax comp implications, uh, that, that really registered with me because I don't think many people uh, have enough understanding of how pension tax, future pension savings all intertwine. So I think I think there is absolutely a need for more help and guidance and advice for many people uh, in, 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 you know, in, in, to be in place. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Ian. On, on that note, Jonathan, can I come back to you sort of ask, um, you know, how can employers, trustees and schemes themselves help members uh, make the best decisions in, in this area? Yeah, so clearly, uh, truly engaging members is 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 the critical piece. I think there's a uh, quite a sea change now here. Um, I think I think the perceived wisdom used to be was that uh, you know as long as you had a, a pension booklet and a and a website that had some flat copy on, then you effectively ticked the box. But I think there's now realization that 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 you know that just isn't good enough because most people actually won't even go to read that stuff and and for the few that do read it um very few will probably understand it um in the way that they they need to understand it so i think there is quite a transformation now towards organizations looking at the process of financial education and also looking at it in the, the broader context of financial well-being because clearly uh one of the issues we have today because again because of the cost of living crisis is is um are people going to start reducing contributions to pensions because they, they need that money for, for, the, for their day-to-day -day living. Now, we haven't really seen um, where that's going. It's very anecdotal at the moment. So, so how big that, that, that issue will become is hard to tell right now. But it is a good example of, of, of where actually there has to be broader communication and people understanding that if they reduce their contributions, um, what impact that may have in terms of Either their retirement pot, or indeed how many more years they will they, they they will need to work. So it's not it's not to say that 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 you know given that they might have to put food on the table, then then clearly it might be quite reasonable that they do reduce those contributions. But it's actually understanding it in the round. Um, but I think that uh, what we what we increasingly find is that people want to talk to people, and so that isn't necessarily regulated advice, but it is uh, helplines or guidance uh, calls that they can do uh, you know, over the telephone or, or indeed over video um, so that they can actually have a chat and talk through some of the, the general principles of what they need to think about. I mean, one of the things that often amazes me is most people do not realise that they can go on the government site and get a state pension forecast. So for a lot of these people, the state pension actually could be a big chunk of, of their income when they retire, and yet they have no idea what that, what that will be. Um, so it is important that there is discussion around things that people need to think about. People have the opportunity to ask those questions and it's done in a timely manner, which is, um, OK, in the purest sense, it would be great that all this stuff started, that the moment somebody walked into the to, to, walked into the workplace. 
but 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 even if if that's that's too ambitious then then it definitely needs to happen by the time people get to about 50 because that is that is when they are then on that uh, uh, path towards retirement and they need to they will need to make actually a number of decisions over the over the coming years Thanks so much, uh, Jonathan. I'm going to pick uh, up later on about the actual age that this guidance needs to start. Uh, but before I do that, um, Stuart, can I come to you and ask what sort of schemes are currently doing in this area and, and to what extent they're considering expanding guidance uh, for, for, for members? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I want to recognise it. it's a very daunting time, uh, you know, facing the biggest inflation threat for over 40 years. It's most acute for uh, retirees and near retirees who often rely on uh, on fixed uh, fixed income. There's a couple of interesting statistics I picked up from Santander Consumer Finance. One third of employees over the age of 45 are struggling with uh, covering their living costs, uh, and one in ten recent retirees are unretiring themselves and returning to work. So I think. From an employer perspective, having a flexible job market will be absolutely key in allowing individuals to transition into, into retirement. And also from an employer's perspective, having a financial wellbeing strategy in place. And from a trustee perspective, from my perspective, it's working with the employer to help pensions form part of the employee value proposition. Get people talking about their finances. You know, at, at the forefront, how do people feel about their finances? In terms of support, well, having delivered numerous pension presentations to employees in a variety of sectors, uh, teachers, childcare homes, uh, warehouses, charities, the one thing that I've learned is that you can't beat taking pensions to the employees, to, to the people. It's a very, it becomes a very emotive topic. There's a lot of engagement, good levels of interest when you get in front uh, in front of people, whether it's group sessions or one-to-one. -one. But it's not always practical, but it's trying to find the best way of replicating that in-person uh, one-to-one uh, feeling. And I think technology has a huge part to play and is, is currently playing, uh, de delivering information through websites, member online portals, apps, social media, and uh, not just information, but planning tools, um, information around uncertain times, whether it's the pandemic, cost of living, scams, of course, is a, is a recent uh, hot topic. Um, but there's also outside support, whether it's guidance or financial advice, uh, and, and being able to allow individuals to tap into that one-to-one -one service with uh, external professional uh, advisors. But I think the key nugget here is, is having a, from an employer perspective and, and a trustee perspective, having a clear communication strategy, setting out what your clear objectives, what you want to achieve uh, are understanding your target audience, uh, understanding your membership, your demographics, uh, the profile of that membership, agreeing on your key messages, the method of uh, delivering those messages. And of course, the important thing is to evaluate the success of your uh, communication strategy. Thank you, Stuart. Um, Ian, um, coming to you on on that point, do you, do, you, do you sort of agree with Stuart's analysis there? You can't beat taking it to the people, as it were, the the one-to-one -one sort of approach. And, and what's your view of what schemes are currently doing in this area? Are, are, are they considering expanding what they're providing with, with regards to guidance and so forth? Well, uh, I, I would agree with Stuart that you can't be get, get get getting out to the to, to to employees and scheme members, and I think there's a real richness uh, to be had in terms of getting people in a room and having a discussion around the table and and hearing their views. And often uh, the table discussion can be as rich as the presentation. Uh, I think the practicalities mean that webinars have to be part of the mix. I think there will be some employees who uh, need uh, to go further and get advice. But, but, but in terms of the point about what schemes and employers are doing, I think one of the things I would call out from my experience is that actually the, the agenda of a, particularly a DB trustee board and a sponsoring employer when it comes to employee engagement uh, has diverged a lot over the years. 
And the reason for this is because the scheme closures for the future accrual and, and the number of employees who are in a DB scheme, as opposed to deferreds and pensioners, is, is obviously more of a minority these days. So, so when you talk to employers, they're interested in uh, helping their employees with their pension, which for many people is DC, and they're, they're probably less uh, interested in helping former employees who might be deferred members of a DB scheme. So I think in terms of DB trustees, I, I think they should uh, and, and can do more to help their membership who are not necessarily employees. And I'm thinking particularly of the, the growing numbers of deferred members. And this plays to the point earlier that, you know, many people are going to have lots of pots of money. And I guess the other big player in that market is DC providers, be it Master Trust or, or, or GPP providers. What are they doing uh, to help their members? Thank you, um, Ian. Uh, Jonathan, coming back to you, you mentioned sort of, you know, in an ideal world, obviously, people would be getting guidance and, uh, and thinking about their pension, you know, all the way from when they join in their 20s and, and, and so forth. That isn't the case. And perhaps sort of it, it's a bit later than that. You suggest the age of sort of 50 has been a reasonable starting point for thinking about this. Um, to, to what extent is, it, 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 you know, does support from that point need to be ongoing? What You know, the, there are lots of things that could happen between 50 and retirement. Minds may change about when to retire or, 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 or indeed in the, you know, few years before retirement, there could be an event such as the uh, guilt market uh, uh, riff uh, that we've had uh, recently. Um, to what extent should this be an ongoing process? Yeah, so I think I think it um, it has to be really because if if really that 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 uh, that line in the sand, if you like, at, at age fifty, give, give or take, is really the line for people. And of course, people will start engaging at that age anyway because they will have, even though retirement may be a good few years away, they will start to have an eye on retirement. So so the population that population as a whole um, w wants to be engaged so the the question is is actually what is that communication program that's that's going to be delivered to them over the next 10 15 years whatever it might be and the start of that process has to be people understanding uh generically what their options are so as, as, as Ian said earlier, people may have a mix of, of different uh, of different schemes. So, so do they understand how benefits are derived from those those different schemes, even at a generic level? You know, even before you get into the real nitty gritty of scheme specifics, do they understand DB? Do they understand DC? Do they understand hybrid if they happen to have have those? Um, but then there has to be an overlay of other things that they need to think about. So, for example, so we mentioned state pension earlier. But they also need to think about, well, what debt do they have right now? Um, uh, can they reasonably expect that that debt is going to be paid off by the time they get to retirement? Or actually, is is the pension or indeed any other, other assets they may have, will, will that need to fund repayment of that debt at the point of, of retirement? Um, um, when looking at those other assets, uh, what role are they going to play? So if people have got ISAs or, or, or other, other maybe taxable assets, um, what role are they going to, to, to play? And clearly, depending on uh, expectation of retirement income, but also um, uh, the level of assets you have, um, it could be very, very different for different people. I mean, for, for those that are the wealthiest, you know, we now live in a world where the, 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 the best inheritance tax planning you can, you can do for, for someone who's, uh, uh, who's going into retirement is to tell them not to use their pension, um, which of course is completely counterintuitive to most people, I'm sure. Um, so, but it just it just does give you an example of of, of why some of the, the the general picture stuff people need to understand. Now, of course, within the, the scheme that they're in at, at that point in time, let's say they are age fifty, as you as you refer to, people are often going into these glide paths. Do they understand why they're going in those the, into those glide paths? Um, do they understand where that's leading them to over the next ten years, fifteen years? Um, what happens if uh, they want to change their mind 
three years in, four years in, five years in, um, uh, 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 do they know they should be reviewing it? Um, who's giving them that information? So actually, when you when you when you step back from it, there needs to be a number of touch points right from let's say age fifty during during the years of of, of the glide path and the lifestyling. So that 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 you know, at the very least, I would argue that that should be once every two or three years, but 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 perhaps more frequently. Then you get to the point where maybe six to 12 months before retirement, they really need to have that rain check again as to what assets they have, how their pension's doing, are they still thinking of retiring at the, at the, at the same time or, or is that moved for, for some reason? So that's another line in the sand. And then of course, there's, a, there's clearly a line in the sand when they actually get to that retirement point in terms of the decisions they make. But of course, even at that point, uh, and, unless, unless they're, uh, uh, going and go, going to go off and, and buy an annuity, which is which is probably unlikely for most people. Then, of course, there's going to be subsequent decisions that they're going to have to make throughout retirement. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're we're seeing already anecdotal evidence of people that have already retired, and because of the cost of living crisis, because of the the the, the uh, because of inflation, um, that now they're saying, well, actually, my plan's not working. I need to reevaluate that plan. Um, and for some, that may mean going back in, going back into the workplace. So I think there has to be a realization that we're now in a world where clearly there's a lot of uncertainty out there. Um, clearly, there's a lot of volatility out there, um, and that just means that people will need to be reviewing this constantly. Um, and then that raises the questions about, well, how how can that be how that how can that be achieved? Because particularly when people get into retirement. And there's been research by people like the Pension Policy Institute saying, well, actually, um, when you get into later retirement and there's, there's cognitive decline and people find it much harder to make decisions, um, um, how's that? How's all that going to play out? So there's a lot to consider. Uh, th thanks for that, Jonathan. And indeed, that tallies in with uh, some of the audience questions we're getting through. Uh, and, and Stuart, I'd just like to put this one to you, if I may, please. Um, I, um, and relating to the glide path and, and given the current high inflation uh, putting pressure on income needs and the gilts cash sort of um, issue we've had um, to, to what what sort of guidance and advice do members need with regards to their investments to ensure that, that their defaults are in the right place to what they want to do? Yeah, I think investments is probably one of the most um technical and complex areas around uh, pensions. Um, I think it's important that, uh, first of all, yeah, trustees are uh, are leading the way in, de in the design of a, a very good uh, default fund. Uh, I don't think it's any surprise that um, the vast majority of members um, won't want to get involved with investments and w would rather leave it to the uh, to the trustee. Um, but the I think you know it's important as as you move through your working life lifetime towards you towards becoming a, a retiree that the right balance of um, cash for income needs and growth for the longer term is is, is struck. That balance is is carefully uh, um, fought through, um, and of course it, it will come very much down to what. What members are going to do with their pension pots at, at, at retirement? Are they going to encash all of their pension pot um, and take it all and, and pay on it for a holiday or a car or pay off debt, or are they going to invest it for, for the longer term? And that's where it's key that that, uh, that balance between income now and uh, growth for the future is is carefully designed. Uh, but again, it will come down to the um, individual members, their own circumstances. If you take inflation, inflation will impact us all in different ways depending on our spending uh, habits um, and I, I come back to um, having that uh, that guidance uh, financial advice on tap what, that members can can call upon and have that one-to-one -one, um, guidance or, or advice um, I, I do personally think it's part of the uh, fiduciary duty of the uh, trustee acting in the best interest of the members and uh, providing that um, support on tap I think that fits uh, very well with the uh, fiduciary duty of the uh, the trustee. Thank you, um, Ian. Anything to add to that at all? 
Well, I, I think when it comes to communication and trying to engage with uh, members, uh, I think I'm a big fan of the little and often. Uh, I think all of us uh, have such, such short uh, spans of attention uh, these days that if we get that 50 page uh, booklet through the post uh, that Jonathan alluded to, the chances are we'll put it somewhere securely to come back to uh, and perhaps never do that. So I'm a big fan of, you know, short messages, nudges, using technology, perhaps videos, films uh, to encourage people at different points in their life to do things. Uh, and I'd love to believe that by the time someone gets to 50 or their mid 50s, uh, they fully understand pensions and they, they're managing all the pension pots if they have more than one. But we all know that for many people, that's not the case. So some of those reminders just need to be consistently saying the same things, but 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 perhaps are, are fine tuned as people get uh, uh, to, towards ages where they can draw their pension and they have access to more material that will allow them to address some of those things. Thanks, Ian. Uh, Jonathan, um, Stuart's been talking about uh, sort of uh, advice and guidance on tap for when people need it. W what, in your view, works best when it comes to supporting members uh, making these decisions? Yeah, so if, if you look at our, our model, we have, I mean, we, we refer to it as, as, as the funnel model. So, so broadly speaking, uh, there's there's three elements to it. So if 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 you if you imagine a funnel, so the the top end is really that education piece. So it's really getting people's heads in the right space. So what are the what? Are, so this is this isn't necessarily personalised at all. It may be it may be specific in the sense that it's talking uh, uh, to them about the, the the scheme that they're currently in with their current employer. But it's still quite generic. So it's still talking about principles. It's still talking about, OK, so if you're going to retire in 10 years time, what are all the things that you need to, to think about? So as we said earlier, you know, what about all the different types of pensions you've got? Do you know, you know, do you have statements? Do you know what types of pensions they are? If not, go and find out. Do you know what your state pension is? If not, go, go and find out. So it's talking about all those broad principles. Now, for some people, they will go through that, that that financial education process and go, that was great, thank you very much, and they might be happy to go off and, and make their own decisions. But actually, that's that's much rarer than, than 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 you might think. What normally happens is because during those generic sessions, it raises so many questions that that individual has never even thought about that all of a sudden they they effectively end up with more questions when they come out than when they went in. Um, and of course, the natural inclination is to 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 want to get a bit more personal about what those those questions are once they understand the high level generics. So that's where you go down to the second stage of the funnel, and you have guidance calls. So you're not you're not talking to a regulated advisor, um, uh, but you are being able to discuss some of those more uh, uh, personal questions and considerations. Uh, but of course, if someone's not a regulated advisor, they can't actually tell you what you should be doing so we often describe this as it's the difference between uh could and should so so a guidance uh, on a guidance call you can say well some of the things that you could do are xyz um but but they can't say this is what you definitely should do because then you have to go to the third stage which is that regulated advice and go through the, the proper fact find with a with a, with a registered individual so that process is is really really important because what it allows the individual the member to do is effectively to select when they want to effectively jump off of that funnel or jump out of that funnel so some will want to go through all three stages uh some may not uh timing as well is a, is an important thing so when you think about those three stages of the funnel that you know that may not necessarily be in a very short period of time that could be over a period of two or three years it could could actually be quite long because actually part one of the things they may realize as they're going through that process is blimey I've, i really haven't got enough money to retire in three years which was my original plan um so so therefore the you know effectively they stay in the workplace and then they revisit the funnel as it were um uh maybe a couple of years later to see if they're in a in, in a better position but i think from the from the trustee, um, uh, the, the scheme perspective and the employer's perspective, I think the, the important thing is always making sure that when processes like that are put in place, 
that actually you are going to organizations that are skilled in doing that and and they understand the difference between what is regulated advice and what isn't regulated advice and 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 the individual effectively is being handheld through that thank you very much indeed um jonathan um and on that point uh, actually we've got a couple of questions in in here sort of on that boundary b between uh, advice and guidance between the two levels of the funnel as it well and 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 sort of what what can be done when members sort of you know feel declined to take financial advice perhaps they don't want to pay for advice or they don't see the value in it but 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 perhaps need need more support and perhaps expect the trustees to uh, look after them as it were it, it, how, how specific can guidance get uh, you know in, in your experience and are most people happy with that yeah so so basically guidance cannot give an individual recommendation because to give a re an individual recommendation um, you have to go through a process of, of fact finding and understanding the objectives and the risk tolerance of the individual, understanding what assets they have, what debts they have, and all the rest of it. So it's a it's a very detailed process, and you need a you need to be a regulated advisor to do that. So I think one of the the but of course saying to um, scheme trustees, saying to employers, saying saying to the member, oh, you need to work out um, you know at what point you need guidance and what point you need advice is is an is a is an unfair expectation really so the way that we operate it is people get that guidance call and if um that individual is asking questions which cannot be an answered by guidance because effectively what they're asking for is is a, in essence specific recommendation given their situation um all our people that work in, 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 in guidance are trained to say, look, I cannot answer that question, but I can make an appointment for regulated advice where that question can be answered. So it's up to you as an individual to decide what you wish to do. Um, but you're quite right, Jonathan, of course, as soon as you get into advice, you get in, you get into more cost. Um, but often the cost objection, if you like, often falls away because if people have gone through this funnel approach, um, it, it, it's almost come the other way. It's almost the individual then saying, actually, I, I really do believe I need regulated advice because I realise that if I don't get this absolutely right, potentially it's going to cost me. So the actual cost of the advice becomes almost insignificant to, to, the, to the bigger picture that they're now, that they're now seeing. Ian, if I can come to you next, please. Um, uh, you know, in your experience, is this sort of this funnel being sort of traditionally one that that trustees and pension schemes have used where they provide guidance or has there been some degree of reluctance among trustees and employers to to sort of provide guidance uh, and access to advice potentially in this way? Well, certainly in my experience, it, it, it's been more the latter, Jonathan, I think, where there has been a reluctance by both employers and trustees because they're worried or historically they've been worried that if they um, um, procure or facilitate some means of getting that final piece, the advice piece, that if there's any future problems with that, that might come back and haunt them. I think that's evolving and changing. But, but one of the things I would call out that came to mind as Jonathan was talking there was, uh, and, and everyone on the call will know this, that for many uh, uh, pension scheme savers, uh, they've never ever sought independent financial advice from anyone about anything. And yet towards the end of their working life, they're being expected to work out the pros and cons of paying for financial advice and then finding out where they can get it from uh, in a marketplace where we know there's there's still fraud and scams out there so I, I think many people many pension scheme savers start from the point where they don't want to pay for advice but they don't necessarily know the pros and cons of why they should so i think going back to the cons point made earlier i think trailing that you know perhaps in the early 50s onwards you know what what decisions you're going to have to make as you approach retirement as a pension saver and what, what what help and advice is out there 
that to me is part of the the plan that should be in place from both uh, trustee boards and employers and, and pension providers. Uh, because if not, people just have a real shock, in my experience, when they get to an age and they're being asked things that they're just not comfortable making decisions on. Uh, and that could include uh, paying for advice because they've never done that before. Uh, and certainly the plethora of other things they're being asked to make decisions on, uh, many, many pension scavers are, are just not comfortable with. So they need help. Thank you. Stuart, uh, would you agree? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I said earlier, you can't beat having that one to one interaction uh, with, with a professional. Um, personal circumstances will differ from one individual to the next. Uh, and what you don't want to do is members spend years and years saving for their retirement, then to, to make some poor decisions, which can undo all of that great work. Um, I mean, th there is some still some nervousness around offering uh, financial advice. Um, but the point I would make is that, you know, from a trustee point of view, your fiduciary duty is acting in the best interest of the membership membership. And I think providing guidance advice sits complements that um, that duty. I think it's important to focus on the member outcomes here and less so worrying about what could go wrong. Um, it's so important to to engage with members, empower them, give them the confidence and the control, which will lead to uh, to better decisions. Um, the, the uh, offering financial advice through your employer, a lot of employees will will trust their their employer probably more so than um, than uh, than leading uh, pension scheme names out there. Um, now, in terms of the, the financial advice, offering it through an employer or a scheme, the advantages are that, that, that the financial advisor, is, there's a vetting process put in place. They will understand your scheme inside and out. And through that group uh, scale, advice can be delivered at uh, very affordable uh, prices. And you, you can pick and choose as well of, of the, the types of advice, what, what you want from, from like a menu. Um, and in terms of you know, coming up with that short list of uh, financial advisors, then, you know, why not have uh, a joint selection panel involving company trustees and you know, a diverse range of the um, the employee uh, or, or pension scheme membership? So we're all buying into that uh, into that process. Thank, thanks so much, uh, Stuart. Jo Jonathan, do you want to come back in there, particularly bit, the bit about choosing advisors? I know that that that's often been a concern, uh, well, of members and of employers and, and trustees. Uh, members concerned they don't quite know where to go to advice, and employers and trustees perhaps that if they choose an advisor, they'll make the wrong choice, and that that may be that may be uh, advice, and it's. It's itself. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I think, and we and we have seen quite a lot of change on this. Um, uh, to be fair, I think that there's now an acceptance, and it, it's the point that that Stuart raises really, which is there's a, there's an acceptance now that there the, the, there is effectively a, a duty of care to make sure that that members understand what their options are, and I think. Probably one of the one of the the, the catalysts to that was was uh, the 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 debacle with British Steel and all the advisors, where actually there wasn't really a robust system put in place. And then, of course, um, uh, uh, members were desperately trying to find advice. Slightly different situation to retirement, although for some it was about retirement. Um, I accept, but it but it did highlight the point that if if members just go off and, and try and find advice themselves. Often they will struggle, and and they will clearly go and engage with 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 the the the, the wrong the wrong people. So, um, in the same way that that schemes and employers would go through due diligence to 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 select um, their the the investment house they're going to use, or the platform they're going to use, um, or the administrator they're going to use, then it is also the case that they should be going through due diligence in selecting a a guidance and a, an advice provider. Um, and they should be looking at some of those key criteria around what what is the regulatory record of that entity, which of course they 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 can check. Um, and and clearly, if there's red flags, then that might be a reason not to not to go with a with a with a with a given provider. Um, 
they should be looking at the qualification level of 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 the advisors as well um again we've seen this historically where of course uh, some advisors may not be qualified to deal with db schemes for example so what what would then happen is that um I mean, the the individual would would deal with one advisor um they part they have part db they want their db looked at so then that first advisor then outsource that to a second advisor who does have the qualification for db and of course what that means is that the the whole process becomes more convoluted point one but point two is of course you're just increasing the cost because now you're in you're involving two advisors rather than one so qualification is is really important uh, other factors may be things like um, how is that advice checked? So in our organization, for example, um, there is a 100% compliance check-in of all reports pre-transaction, whereas the, 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 if you like, the industry standard, and, and in fact, all the regulator requires is that there's, there's, there's sample check-in, but post-transaction. But our argument is often, well, what about if you find some horror stories and the transaction's already taken place? That that doesn't seem to be putting the member in a, in a particularly good position. So um, those are just a few things that should be thought about within that due diligence. And the, the other big thing, I think, is, is, is going and finding providers that specialise in the workplace. Because I think one of the other things as well is the member often then en ends up, they're doing it themselves, in, if you like, the retail IFA world, which is a very, very different world to the workplace world. Um, so not only is the, the employer or the scheme able to go through the DD, negotiate preferential pricing, as Stuart mentioned, um, but actually also knowing as part of that DD that, you know what, if this firm does it for other large organizations and that's the day job and they can get good references from those other organizations, then actually the risk of taking on that provider is probably quite minimal. Thank you very much indeed. Ian, can I come over to you? Is 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 there uh, uh, more that trustees can be doing, being more proactive in all of this? I, I think so. Uh, I, and I guess I'm, my mind drifts back to a point I made earlier, which is particularly for DB trustee boards, active members either don't exist anymore or a minority and deferreds and pensioners increasingly make up the majority of DB DB member compositions, if I can put it that way, and and employers are going to be more um, are not as focused on the needs of deferred, whereas the trustees should be equally focused on deferred as they are on pensioners and where there are actives, actives, uh, and and where do those deferreds get help from if it's not part of a financial well-being program from an old employer and their current employer doesn't have one. So I think the trustee boards are doing more and I would encourage them to do more. Uh, and if that's a funnel type approach, as Jonathan talked about, that would be fantastic. And for those uh, pension scheme members who need to take advice, they've got the comfort of uh, uh, an advisor that's been vetted and regularly monitored by the trustee board. That, in my mind, would be fantastic. Stuart, it's it, it sort of uh, coming to you. To to um, as a professional trustee, to what extent do you sort of recommend uh, where where an advice option doesn't exist uh, uh, within a scheme or, or, or a sort of well organised guidance option? To what extent are you recommending that you know employers and and, and trustees put those in place? Uh, I mean, I've certainly been proactive uh, in discussion in discussions with uh, with the employer. I think it's very important from a trustee perspective that you are you are working in tandem with the employer uh, and not uh, certainly against uh, against their wishes. Um, but I think the, the important thing is being proactive, um, raising the profile, and, and going back to financial well-being, which I've talked about. Um, you know, just all of, this is all about feeling getting the employees, members to feel secure and in control of their finances. And, uh, you know, pensions forms part of the reward, the total reward package. And financial well-being, you know, runs through your entire working life uh, and is, is for everyone from the graduate employee grappling with uh, their debt, rising uh, rent costs, 
the single parent grappling with childcare costs to um, near retirees grappling with the cost of living crisis. It, it really is there for running through through the entire working life uh, uh, um, duration. Um, so I, I really do think it, it, it's you know, offering the guidance advice option is really uh, a paramount importance. And just bear in mind the complexity. You know, it's not just about pensions. There's debt, shorter term savings, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's very difficult to um, to try and provide guidance around pensions in isolation. You've got to look at the whole uh, the whole financial package of of, uh, of an individual. Thank you. Um, and there's been, a, you know, quite a, a bit historically that's inhibited trustees and employers um, from doing sort of more in the financial well-being space as well as through into um, uh, guidance. And obviously, we're coming into a, a period uh, of recession, perhaps where costs will even be more constrained and that, that will become a, a, a bigger issue. What, what do you think can be done to break down some of those barriers, uh, with, you know, with employers and to sort of make, you know, help them understand the need for that broader financial education and, and guidance program? Well, I think they need to listen to their employees. I think uh, increasing and COVID's helped in a, in a way. You know, employers are listening to their employees in terms of the challenges they face. Uh, and, you know, it morphs into all sorts of areas in, in terms of absenteeism, uh, health problems, uh, mental health issues. So employers are more uh, savvy to that, it strikes me. Uh, they understand that often financial concerns can be at the heart of that. Some of that might be pension issues, uh, particularly for older folk uh, or older employees uh, in the workplace, perhaps. Uh, so I think I think for many employers, uh, they are doing more, uh, but they could do even more. Uh, I think trustee boards are an important component in this. I think there's also important stakeholders like trade unions. Trade unions have an important uh, voice in all of this. I think pension providers are, are, are increasingly important. Uh, and I'm labouring the point, but, you know, for those uh, pension savers who have more than one pension pot, which might be the majority of folk, you know, where do they get their help and advice and guidance uh, from, uh, particularly uh, as they approach retirement? And if it's not their current employer because they don't do it, uh, but they have pension savings pots from previous employers who do, then it's not really helping them. Uh, and that's where the pension providers and particularly the trustees could do more, I think. Thank you. Jonathan, anything to add to that at all? Sorry, I have problems with my phone. Um, uh, yeah, no, I think um, uh, I, th I think that's right, and I think that the 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 I think the the, the sea change that we're we're seeing now, particularly on the on the trustee side, is that um, uh, is that point that Ian's made about the deferreds, because uh, up until uh, Freedom and Choice came in, uh, we primarily worked for the employer, um, and I think that the employer. Uh, uh, clearly has a, a vested interest in the actives, but does, doesn't really have any interest whatsoever in the deferreds. And I think when uh, uh, trustees started to say, well, hold on a minute, now we've got freedom and choice, we need to think about all members, in, including the deferreds. I think that was one of the key uh, or the, the critical moments, if you like, in terms of trustees starting to say, actually, um, we do now need to have a process, we do need to put something in place. Clearly, if we can put stuff in the workplace, and that's great, but that doesn't work for the deferreds. So, what are the options that we need to put in place for that for that group of people? Thank you. Uh, any, any additional thoughts on that one, Stuart? Um, I think I thought the pensions regulator and the FCA uh, put out a very good um, guidance piece. I think that was back in um, 2021. Uh, what you can do without been authorised by the FCA, and that clearly applies to, um, to pension schemes and trustees alike. Uh, but the key message was, um, you know, yes, absolutely fine to put out um, factual information, signpost members to uh, other areas of, uh, of information, but stay clear of um, giving that advice, recommendation, and um, stay clear of financial products. 
Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. And indeed, thank you all of you for taking part in this webinar. We're coming to the end of our discussion now. Um, if I can just go around you all and ask you for your uh, sort of concluding thoughts or key takeaways uh, following our discussion, that would be great. Stuart, I'm sorry, I have to start somewhere. May, may I ask you first, please? <laughs> Yes, thank you, Jonathan. Um, I mentioned about the fiduciary duty acting in the best interest of the members. Um, we mustn't forget people spend years and years saving for their retirement, but poor decision making can undo all of the good work in an instant. Get people talking about their finances, give them the support, give them the confidence, the control, and find the best way of delivering that support, be it guidance, advice, or, or both. Thank you. Uh, Ian? Uh, well, I would echo all of Stuart's comments. Uh, nice summary there, Stuart. Um, I think I would encourage uh, trustee boards to be um, perhaps braver in terms of some of the things they do. I'd encourage employers to uh, do more. You know, good employers will always do good stuff, but there's lots of other employers who could do more. I think one of the stakeholders we haven't touched on uh, and I have some personal experience of this over the last year in terms of drawing my own pensions. And it doesn't have sharpen your, your thoughts when you're looking at your own pension as opposed to, you know, the offering to employees and colleagues. Um, but, but, but administrators, I think administrators, particularly the big ones, could do much more and be better in terms of their interface with the members of pension schemes and, and various pension providers. So I think there's a lot more we can do to help people make those informed decisions uh, and, and, and not make mistakes. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, very much indeed. Uh, Jonathan. Yeah, I think my message is, is, is quite simple, really, and, and we've discussed it a lot today, is, 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 is have a process. Now, in terms of where to start with that process, I think if you think about uh, the, the education, the guidance and advice, that might be a, a good starting point. Um, uh, you can then drill down in terms of actually, well, when we talk about education, what does that education look like? How is that education delivered? Who is it delivered to? Um, so all of, the, all of that detail can ultimately come out. But I think it's a good place to start. Um, and I think the, the, the other thing which is attached to that process is just really think about um, the due diligence that needs to be done. Because I think if you think long and hard about what is the process, what is the RFP process? What are those questions that you're going to going to ask providers? Actually, just just going through that process of thinking about that um, should um, reassure uh, the, the the trustees and indeed the the employer that they are the, you know they are they have thought about it. They are asking the right questions, and then if they don't get the answers that they 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 would expect, they know they know that that provider isn't probably the best place to go. Thank you, uh, Jonathan, and thank you all. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for in this webinar. All that remains for me to do is thank our speakers, Jonathan Watsley, Stuart Walters, and Ian Baines for taking part, and indeed for all of you for listening in. Please do join us for another webinar soon. Thank you very much indeed.